Aloha, everyone. Um, just want to welcome you to the September webinar for the Hawaii Public Health Training, HUI. Our training today is Behind the Headlines, Opioid Use and Treatment in Hawaii. I'd like to start by introducing myself. My name is Stephanie Moyer, and I'm the Community Initiatives and Training Coordinator for the Hawaii Public Health Training, uh, excuse me, the Hawaii Public Health Institute. Um, other organizers of this training are Makamai Namahoi, hi fis Contracts, Grants, and Operations Assistant, as well as um, the Hui Steering Committee, which is made up of 14 members from various organizations. I'd like to acknowledge our sponsors and partners for today's webinar, the Hawaii Public Health Training Hui, our sponsors, the Western Region Public Health Training Center, and the Public Health Learning Network. For those of you seeking continuing education credits, um, we are offering them in these various areas today, social work, CSAC, CHES, RD, and RN. Um, we do have the approval codes listed on this slide and these slides will be sent out to you if you do need to note down those learning codes. Um, regarding the continuing education credits, to receive those credits, you will need to complete our evaluation survey. Um, I will be sending that out following the completion of the webinar today. Um, you will have two weeks to complete this evaluation, and then we will send out your certificates to you by October 4th. If for some reason you have not received the email with the evaluation link, please feel free to call me or um, send me an email and let me know. And then same thing goes, if you have not received your certificate but have completed the evaluation, please feel free to reach out to either myself or Maka to help you out with that. Also, for those that are calling into the webinar today, please be sure to send me an email letting me know your phone number um, and that you um, attended via the phone. And my email is Stephanie, so that's S-T-E-P-H-A-N-I-E at hi-fi, H-I-P-H-I dot O-R-G. Disclosure, the planners and presenters have no relevant financial relationships to disclose. For those seeking um, the nursing continuing education credits, um, please remember that you have to go on to the University of Arizona's website and complete their nursing evaluation. This evaluation uh, does expire after two weeks or two weeks after the training and the password to access this is headlines with a capital H. Today's webinar is is via Zoom and it is being recorded. We will be placing the recording of this webinar up on the Public Health Training Hui's YouTube channel and I will be sure to share that link in the chat box. Learning outcomes for today's webinar, um, first is to identify approved medications to treat opioid use disorder, discuss opioid intervention and updates about management of opioid use disorder, and discuss referral resources and services are available for opioid-dependent clients in Hawaii and appropriately coordinate care for patients. So I'm very excited to introduce you to our guest speakers today. First, we have Heather Lusk, who is the executive director of two different agencies that merged um, into the Hawaii Health and Harm Reduction Center project. Heather has over 20 years of experience dedicated to reducing health disparities and stigma as it relates to HIV, viral hepatitis, and other chronic conditions linked to substance use. As a community leader, Heather works to support systems integration and the intersection of mental health, substance use, homelessness, chronic health conditions, and the criminal justice system. I'm also very excited to introduce you to Dr. Christina Wang. She is a nurse practitioner with the Hawaii Health and Harm Reduction Center. She's particularly has focused her efforts around wound care in the community with emphasis on street-based practice in Honolulu, providing care to those most vulnerable, including those who are houseless and persons who inject drugs. Christina also works with clients living with HIV AIDS, 
hepatitis, and to support efforts around care for those with mental illness and substance abuse. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Heather and Dr. Christina Wang. Hi, I'm not sure if you guys can hear me over at Queens, but Heather, you're muted. I'm not sure if the attendees can hear me. This is Steph again. Um, I have notified them that you folks can't hear. So hopefully they're working on unmuting her right now. Hi, can you hear us, folks? Okay, we can hear us now. Okay. All right, hopefully folks can hear me now. And if you can, if you could just let us know in the chat some. Thanks so much for your patience. Again, this is Heather Lusk. I am the Executive Director of the Hawaii Health and Harm Reduction Center. And I'm honored to have Dr. Christina Wang with me. I'll be starting out with a quick overview of opioids, what's happening in Hawaii with the Hawaii Opioid Initiative. Uh, look at some Hawaii specific data. Turn over to Dr. Wang to talk about the importance of doing pain management, um, as well as medications for opioid use disorder, and then I'll come back and um, end our time together. So as you heard, we are the Hawaii Health and Harm Reduction Center. We are at the intersection of justice, chronic disease like HIV, hepatitis, at the mental health system, substance use, homelessness. So we serve about 1,700 people a year, um, and many of them cycle through these systems. And we also provide um, uh, really enhanced services for people with opioid use disorder, which is why we're here today. So oh, there's my agenda. So sorry, a little bit late. So again, we're gonna go over the data, talk about the HOI, and really hope that if you're not involved with the Hawaii Opioid Initiative, that maybe you will be. And then Dr. Wang will bring you through some clinical pieces of pain management and treatment. And then we'll talk about naloxone and overdose uh, and some great resources. Thanks again for joining us today. So I like to say the opioid opportunity, um, even though the headlines are talking about the opioid crisis and the opioid epidemic on the continent, we are blessed in Hawaii that we are ahead of the curve. Um, methamphetamine is still the drug of choice according to our treatment providers and our law enforcement. However, we are seeing more fentanyl um, in the islands and really need to be prepared to experience what they're seeing on the continent. And that's why uh, Dr. Wang and I will be talking about what we've learned over the last few years in Hawaii with a focus on opioids and hopefully that we can take these lessons to leverage the entire substance use continuum. 
as many of you know, there's been many, many opioid epidemics. Um, we had morphine that was utilized. Again, most of the drugs that we're talking about have a therapeutic effect. Uh, and why I won't take a lot of time to talk about it today, many of you have probably seen the headlines about Purdue getting in trouble um, and that many people talk about that the settlement with opioid manufacturers will probably be even larger than tobacco settlement. So we're gonna be seeing a lot more attention, um, but this is just one of many epidemics, but I think that the prescription aspect of this epidemic has made it different than others. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, we are talking about um, both natural and synthetic um, opioids that uh, predominantly um, are, are used to both uh, affect both coughing and, and be a cough suppressant. They're also used um, for um, other kind of other uh, medical purposes. And then of course, many people um, may use them for you know, self-medication or for other purposes. Um, and so in addition to their analgesic or cough suppressant properties, we're gonna show you a video in a bit to also understand the impact on the brain, how that affects pain, and also how it may um, impact people with opioid use disorder in their cravings, managing withdrawal, and then hopefully also treatment. Um, but when we talk about the, 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 the medication or talking about opioids, we're really talking about a spectrum. We have our, what's called a pure agonist, and I'm going to allow Dr. Wang to, as, a, as a medical provider to answer any specific questions. But usually what we're talking about there is that it binds to the receptor cell fully. Um, and uh, that usually, um, when we're talking about that, could be morphine, oxycodone, uh, heroin. Um, and then our antagonists block that receptor. So for example, if someone's experiencing an acute overdose of opioids, they may take naloxone um, and that will block the receptor for a short amount of time so the person comes out of and does not have those opioid effects. And then you have your mixed agonists or antagonists. Um, and Dr. Wang will talk to you a lot about buprenorphine, um, which both basically uh, helps the person with the craving so they're not craving opioids, but also um, has some of the naloxone in there so that they're not um, getting super high or going out and using other medications and kind of manages that balance. So you'll be hearing more about these as we walk through the day. Uh, as I mentioned, um, opioids, we have, a, you know, in our body, we have naturally occurring chemicals that are released when we have opioids in our system. And a couple of things that's important to know, and I know many of you already know this, but that um, as people use it more over time, opioids, the body becomes more used to it. And research says within a week or, or more, people will become um, more dependent and that means they'll have a higher tolerance and need more of the drug to get the same effect. And the reason that's important is as we'll talk about overdose, people may have an increased tolerance for opioids, then have some kind of break whether that's you know, uh, through treatment or incarceration or any other reason, they come back and use the same amount of opioids because they had that tolerance. And unfortunately, that's where we see opioid-related deaths. So understanding the tolerance is important, as well as um, when you learn more about the withdrawal, Dr. Wang will talk about how important it is to understand withdrawal um, and a scale she uses to assess people for induction to buprenorphine. Um, so the DSM criteria for withdrawal is very specific. Um, and what we find in our population is many people use opioids to, uh, to not go into withdrawal and not necessarily to get the psychotropic effects that they first got. Again, I'm gonna to defer to Dr. Wing, um, but I wanna note that we have very clear criteria for opioid use disorder. Um, and we're trying to really use the term OUD um, and not use the term as much addiction or use opioid use or misuse. Um, but also understanding that because of the complexity of dependence and the impact on the physiology of our body, um, as Dr. Wang will talk about, treatment is more complicated than it may be for some of the other um, uh, DSM substance use disorders. We have four uh, approved medications for substance use disorder if you include the injectable naltrexone. And again, I'm going to leave this to Dr. Wang, but we're really it's fortunate um, that we have these medications because as many of you know, with methamphetamine actually being the biggest drug, we do not have medications for um, stimulant use disorder the way we do for opioids and alcohol. And the research on these are very clear and more and more we are seeing very clear guidelines from whether it's SAMHSA um, or other regulatory bodies about the importance of offering people these, um, these medications if they are diagnosed with opioid use disorder. So I'm going to let the experts at PBS talk to you a bit more about the impact of opioids on the brain. I think they do a better job than I do. We'll do a short video and then I'll come back and talk to you a bit about what's happening in Hawaii around opioids and the Hawaii Opioid Addiction.
They cannot. Okay, forgive me. It sounds like you cannot hear. So we are adjusting that right now. Thank you. I'm not too sure what their program over here means. Um, so can we, I believe we might just share it. Is that, is that okay? okay? We can just share the link after. I apologize, folks who are on the line waiting for the video, but I don't think we can figure out the audio. Um, with enough time for the, we want to respect folks' time with the training. So we'll share the video, we'll share the link after okay. if that's okay. Okay. Sorry. Apologies. No, it, no, I th think that's okay. So thank you. Um, it's, it is, I think it's a really good video that not only helps understand the ways that opioids affect the brain, but also starts to, as we look at what we've learned through the last few years of, because it's kind of First, many people saying maybe not, uh, you know, managing pain well in the clinical setting. And then we got these guidelines that actually, I think, swung the pendulum the other way with now we're seeing folks with massive pain sometimes getting cut off of their opioids and, and, and maybe not having what they need to manage their pain. This video really shows and helps understand why people become de dependent on opioids, how the effects happen over time, and then how these treatments, um, like whether it's uh, buprenorphine or even naloxone that reverses opioids. So I would encourage you, once they send out the link, uh, to check out the video. And thank you for your patience with our technical difficulties. We appreciate it. Oh, oh there it is. Societies have coveted opioids for the euphoria and the pain they provide. <laughs> In the 1800s, when chemists extracted morphine from opium poppies, it became the go-to treatment for the American Civil War. After morphine caused widespread addiction, drug companies invented what they thought was a non-addictive substitute, a cough syrup called heroin. That turned out poorly for the 20th century. Today, prescription opioids like fentanyl and oxycodone crowd America's medicine cabinets and its streets. Opioid overdoses now kill more Americans every year than car accidents. But to understand how we arrived here, we need to measure pain into the mind. Here's why our brains love opioids. When opioids enter the brain, they land on tiny docking stations at the end of your nerves called receptors. Typically, the receptors catch chemical messengers called neurotransmitters to activate your nerve cells. Opioid receptors do just the opposite. They stop electrical pulses from traveling through your nerve cells, also known as neurons. This dampening is handy for the pain relief. Say you have chronic back pain. Your inflamed muscles are constantly sending pain signals to your brain via neurons in your spine. Opioids quiet those nerves, relieving your pain. Opioids have three major receptors, mu, kappa, delta. But the mu receptor is the one to remember. The mu receptor is responsible for the consequences of almost all opiates. It slows breathing, eliminates pain, and fills the mind with warm euphoria. But too much of this opioid off-switch becomes addictive. Opioid addiction starts in the midbrain, where mu opioid receptors turn on a batch of nerve cells called GABAergic neurons. GABAergic neurons are themselves an off-switch for pleasure. They prevent other midbrain neurons from flooding the brain's pleasure circuits with another transmitter, dopamine. Dopamine, uh, a party at first, and then there's no response, you know, no, uh, no consequences right away. At one stop along these pleasure circuits, the nucleus accumbens, the dopamine triggers a surge of happiness that reinforces the idea that opioid drugs are rewarding. And in our brain's fear center, the amygdala, Dopamine relieves anxiety and stress. Just an overall sense of well-being, uh, no problems, or just warm. Decision-making brain areas become overwhelmed and cravings set in. All drugs come with the dark side as they clear the body. 
This is known as withdrawal. Mm -hmm. Too much beer causes a hangover the next day. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Cocaine high is followed by a crash, but opioids, especially long lasting ones like methadone, don't change a person's outward behaviors. You can still drive and go to work. I was a functioning addict. Um, I worked at a real estate company. I was a broker for nine different ages. However, opioids cause brain circuits to slowly adopt a new state of normal. Soon, without opioids in the body, addicts feel constantly anxious. Their stress hormones stay elevated. I just remember waking up and everything was blurry and I felt really bad. Opioids typically trigger constipation and tweak body temperature. Remove them, and a person with opioid dependence has persistent diarrhea, hot and cold sweats, and goosebumps. Some describe opioid withdrawal as the sickest feeling they've ever had, and the desperate hunger for relief drives addiction. All I had to be Oxycontin. And my jean pocket, and I, I couldn't find it. And I remember just crawling all around on the ground. I didn't know what was happening to me. Here's the dangerous kicker the potency of opioids diminishes over time if you abuse them. Eventually, rather than remedy your chronic back problem, your pain becomes linked with the emotional and physical toil of opioid withdrawal. It becomes a vicious cycle. Popping more painkillers or injecting heroin more frequently becomes the way to keep all those bad feelings at bay. Or if you started recreational, a struggle against withdrawal becomes all consuming. You keep chasing that high and uh, you never get that original feeling again and you kind of get immune to it. And then you just, you're just maintaining and then without it, you're sick. <laughs> Thank you for getting that to work. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to transition here to overdose uh, before I, and a little bit of data in Hawaii. So it is the leading cause of accidental death in Hawaii and on the continent. Um, about 130 people die each day of uh, opioid overdose. I will note that we in Hawaii were 43rd uh, in overdose deaths a couple of years ago. We're now 3 out of 51. That's good news. We have made progress, and I think many people attribute that to the Hawaii Opioid Initiative, which is entering its third year, because again, we were able to utilize opioid resources from the federal government, um, and since we're not as ravaged as we see, we are able to really get the naloxone out there, as we'll talk about, expand buprenorphine and medications for opioid use disorder, and really bring together a public health, public safety response to respond. I think the most troubling thing in the slide indicated on the bottom is that over time, uh, the data, uh, excuse me, the data from uh, the CDC is very clear. We now have a decrease in prescription overdoses, but an increase in heroin and fentanyl related overdoses. Uh, and it, the, the data is really clear that that's coming from, unfortunately, the efforts to try to curb prescription drug misuse and overprescription without addressing the underlying opioid use disorder that many of these folks have. In fact, we have somebody in my program, I'll call him Joe. He was working in construction, got hurt, got a workman's comp, um, and was forced to go back to work before he felt he was ready. Um, so he upped his, the pain medications to manage the pain while he worked. His doctor then cut him off without any, in his mind, any other options. And then he came to our program after finding heroin on the streets. Um, he now is um, in recovery from opioids, but that's an example of where that could have gone very awry and has with other people in our program because uh, that, that pain management very, is a very important piece and is often how many folks get into their opioid use. So these graphs are, are uh, indic indicative of what I just mentioned. So we continue to have increases, this is on the continent nationwide, of overdose deaths. Um, any opioid, we had about 48,000 last year. These are the ones involving prescription opioid medications. As you'll see, they relatively leveled out because of whether it's the CDC's pain, um, pain managing guidelines, which by the way, they actually put out a, a thing saying, wait, don't take our guidelines too seriously and go too far because they've now seen this, this kind of rebound effect that we've had. Um, but look at heroin increases. So again, all we've really done is shift some of the overdose deaths from the prescriptions to heroin because that underlying opioid use disorder was not addressed in some folks who were using. And Dr. Wang's going to talk to you about what we know works uh, for working with people with opioid use disorder so that we can prevent that from happening here in Hawaii. 
just want to note a couple other things that we're seeing is not just increases in overdose deaths, we're seeing outbreaks of hepatitis C um, in places that we've never seen before. We're actually seeing it in children because young women of, of childbearing age are getting it when really, um, for example, in Hawaii, our cohort of people with hep C are really older, and this is bringing a lot of younger people in. We're even seeing outbreaks of hepatitis B despite vaccinations because of the opioid crisis. So this is not just um, opioids, but many things around them, including, as I mentioned, overdose, but also these infectious disease that go along with people, particularly who inject. Oops, sorry, went the wrong way. Um, so we also are seeing an increase in wounds, and that is Dr. Wang's specialty. Um, as people, um, the research shows clearly that most folks will, if they start with, um, you know, prescription opioids, they, there's a chance they may bridge into injecting, especially if they can't get those anymore. Um, and that's when we see a lot of these injection related uh, infections. And I don't know, Dr. Wang, you'll talk more about that, but you see quite a bit uh, of injection related, not to mention uh, infections related to homelessness. So what about Hawaii? You saw this data about overdose on the continent. Well, in Hawaii, it's a little bit different uh, as usual. So this is from the Department of Health, the Injury Prevention Program in the EMS IPB. And what they found, as you see here, is that 50 to 59 is the average age of people in Hawaii who uh, had a, an overdose of opioid pain relievers. And not just is it older, so on the continent, it's more in your kind of 18 to 30 range, but the same research looked at people who had died of an opioid overdose and found that many of them had a legitimate prescription for opioids. So I wanna note that this isn't just the street users that might access Dr. Wang and I's program, but we're talking about anybody who has, um, who may have an opioid prescription could be at risk. Um, just recently, we had uh, a story from somebody who got naloxone from us who saved her 80 year old grandmother um, that wasn't why she got the naloxone, but she happened to be there when her grandmother took too much of her her prescribed opioids and luckily was there with naloxone. Um, and the EMS said that, that she saved her grandma's life. As I mentioned, the data from our treatment programs is still predominantly methamphetamine and ICE. This comes from the Alcohol and Drug Abuse Division, um, but there has been an increase in opioids um, reported for folks going in. And then Many folks, and I'd be curious if folks on the, on the line and in Zoom see this, but we're seeing a lot more poly substance use. So where we used to see people who maybe only used uppers or downers, you know, ice or, or opioids, we're now seeing folks that will use whatever they can get their hand on, yeah, Dr. Wing? Um, and that particularly um, has been a big shift uh, and is much more complicated to treat. So data uh, that shows from the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, this is done in Hawaii schools, public schools, uh, middle and high. Um, we're doing it again this year in 2019. As you see here, one in eight public high school students in Hawaii said that they used a pain prescription medication without a prescription. So that's a lot higher than I thought it would be. But look at uh, this number. Look at how many reported injection in Hawaii the middle school particularly, I really hope this is a statistical blip, but 7.1 of our middle schoolers said they hadn't tried injection drugs. Uh, and that's really troubling, especially when we see that it's higher in our lesbian, gay, and gender non-conforming and transgender communities. So they are gonna add it to the 2019 Youth Risk Behavior Survey to see if this is trend, because uh, hopefully this was an anomaly, but this is very troubling that we do need to again work with our young people to better understand the risks, especially because we're talking about medications they may find in their, um, you know, in their medicine cabinet. So um, the last piece I'm going to talk about before I turn it over to Dr. Wang is the Hawaii Opioid Initiative. Hopefully many of you on the line have been involved. We started just about uh, two years ago. Uh, and we are about to release our, what's called Opioid 3.0, or the update to our strategic plan and initiative. This has been an incredible experience. I'm blessed to be the co-chair with um, our wonderful Thaddeus Pham of work group number four, which is around prevention education. Um, and we do have a website, hawaiiopioid.org. Uh, it's not just about the HOI, but trying to put every uh, opioid resource in Hawaii on that website. So we encourage you to check it out, um, learn more about it. We do have seven work groups that meet regularly and on our executive level, we meet monthly. We have a data group, a prescriber and pain management group, treatment access group, actually it's meeting right now, um, our prevention and public education that runs the website. We have a pharmacy-based group, our law enforcement group, and our screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment. So these 
these groups are not only looking at opioids, but trying to make changes that are system wide and will leverage changes across our entire continuum. So a great example is our treatment group has been focusing on CARES. Uh, if you haven't heard about CARES, CARES is the comprehensive, a comprehensive access to resources entry system that's starting October 1. And it's gonna be for all substance use treatment in, on every island in the state. We'll be able to call this number and get access to treatment resources. Um, it's not gonna start being 24 seven, but eventually it will be. And the school of uh, the UH School of Social Work is running that, you'll hear a lot more. That's an example of where that was a priority of HOI, but obviously CARES helps the entire continuum. So we really realize that these, lim these dollars that are specific to opioids, in fact, you might've seen the article this week that uh, DOH has got four more million for opioids, will help us leverage changes across the entire substance use continuum. So I won't spend too much more time, but just note that here's, we have these four cards that uh, the University of Hawaii Office of Public Health Studies works with us to help us track our outcomes. So this is number one, looking at treatment in Hawaii and doing the, the coordinated entry. Um, our number two, our prescriber group are doing what are called MOCA minutes, little five minute uh, continuing education for providers and prescribers on getting um, how to manage pain and alternatives to opioid use, how to manage OUD. We've also partnered with, our, with the Behavioral Health Echo uh, to do that. Our number three is really trying to look at um, both our prescription drug monitoring program, our PDMP, which is now mandated for use for all, from all prescribers, and also just trying to help all aspects of, of, of data collection. So for example, uh, the Department of Health was able to look at where in the state there were overdose deaths. So now the Haida narcotics enforcement folks are looking at drug related deaths from the law enforcement perspective, and we can overload those maps and really look at where the issues are in our state. Again, the work group that I chair, we do, in, we do not only a website, but we focus a lot on the take back boxes. So another unintended consequence um, of um, over prescribing opioids is a large volume or inventory of them in people's medicine cabinets. We used to only have two times a year that you could dispose of medications. People would flush that so we got our water supply or they would get into the um, kind of the dark, you know, the, the underground economy. So now uh, sites all over the state that can take back medications for free. And we have a whole, uh, on the website, um, under take back, we have a, a map on where you can do that. Our pharmacy group, I am happy to say that pharmacists are now allowed to prescribe naloxone. Yes, not just distribute, just uh, prescribe. So our pharmacist group is working on getting that moving um, and because Medicaid does cover naloxone, you're gonna see a lot more access and public education to encourage people with opioid prescriptions or if they're using opioids to go get a prescription of naloxone. And again, it's covered by um, all Medicaid plans and most commercial health insurances. I have to say, since um, as someone who's worked 25 years in public health, I'm most inspired by our law enforcement collaboration. And in my 25 years in public health, I've never seen such collaboration with law enforcement. As one of my law enforcement allies say, you cannot arrest your way out of, the, out of this epidemic. So there's times when we need a criminal justice response, and there's times when we need a public health response, and our law enforcement folks are really helping make that happen with this law uh, work, number, work group number six. So they're looking at things like lead, law enforcement assisted diversion, trainings, but also ensuring that when it is a, a public safety issue, that our law enforcement have the tools they need um, to keep us safe. And then lastly, our screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment. This is um, an intervention that people can be trained in. It takes about five minutes uh, where providers, particularly primary care providers and other clinical settings can screen to see if somebody's at risk for any substance use disorder. And now with CARES, with one number to call, it'll be easier for folks to do that assessment and then have one number to call to triage and link people to the uh, accurate clinical care that they need. It's just about our take back boxes that I mentioned. Oh, I so lied, I wasn't quite done. So my last one is our policy. So I, I won't spend much time here, but we have a lot of policies and the movement on, on opioids. The one I want you to pay attention to the most is Act 68, which does give you immunity for naloxone, which I'll mention a bit later. Act 153 now mandates all prescribers to use the prescription drug monitoring program. And again, Act 255, which is allowing pharmacists to prescribe naloxone. So on that, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Wang, who's gonna to talk to you about managing pain and opioid use disorder, and then I'll be back to talk about how to save lives with naloxone. Thank you, everybody. Hi, thanks everyone. 
Heather is a wealth of knowledge, so it's a hard act to follow, and she is really stellar at keeping dialed in and on the forefront of all the different initiatives that Hawaii is doing. And I think that's um, so important because I think we have the opportunity to get ahead of um, you know what's happened on the continent. And um, anyway, I think that Heather summed that up nicely for us. So I'm gonna just briefly here talk about um, a couple different things. These uh, are some slide decks that I also uh, am sharing to you. Um, and I have the references included uh, later in the slide deck um, to a great conference that I went to uh, over the summer with UCSF uh, that talked about pain management in the primary care setting. And I really enjoyed the takeaway messages um, from a few of this um, physician from the Veterans Administration that spoke. So, you know, I think it's important for us to remember that no single modality for pain management is the right way. Uh, it has to be a continuum and we have to continue to reassess pain and what the functional goals are. And I have to be really upfront with my patients about what are their functional goals and if that's realistic. So, Again, pain relief is on a continuum, so is functional, um, you know, desire and, and goals of quality of life. Um, we're, we're hoping towards things like improved, better quality of sleep, decreased depression, uh, fatigue and anxiety, uh, overall functionality. I had a patient tell me yesterday, their functional status would just be to be able to stand at the sink and wash their dishes and go to the grocery store without crying and being in so much back pain that they can't even do those simple tasks. So where can we help them assist in this? Failure with one modality does not necessarily mean failure in others. And I really try to stay away from the term failure. I think it's just a learning process. And this is a difficulty with pain management because patients um, are in such intense pain, oftentimes they don't have the patience for us to explore uh, over time what uh, pain management uh, you know, is, is ultimately the best to achieve their functional status. Um, success or what I like, you know, like I said, failure can be determined within two to four weeks of success being achieved. So we shouldn't stick with something that we know isn't working past four weeks. It's not giving us any achieved pain um, goals. And I'd like to reiterate looking at a pain management contract with patients because it spells out clearly what my role is as the provider. It spells out clearly what patient's role is. And it also helps us sign an informed consent, uh, which talks about safety of medications because sometimes um, opioids can be an appropriate pain management tool. So framework for managing chronic pain, establish a diagnosis. Um, it's kind of beyond our scope here. I'm not gonna go into how to work up a full assessment or a diagnosis, but um, you know, it's really important to be able to access the appropriate diagnostic tools necessary. Um, that may be not just plain film x-rays, right? That may be CTs and MRIs and consulting our other uh, pain management and other uh, providers in our community to, to make sure we actually get an appropriate diagnosis. Um, I would like to point out oftentimes for our folks that use um, IV drugs, we really need to rule out that it's not an infectious process in nature. I see several patients um, several times a week with things called like paraspinal and epidural abscesses. So when they talk about back pain, I need to ensure I'm not masking the pain with pain medication and not treating the underlying um, diagnoses, which could actually be that the abscess and the infection needs to be under control before we can move forward with better pain management versus finding out it's something more anatomical current state of functionality. Um, current and past treatments is really important. Patients really hate when they feel like their time has been wasted, that you go backward and repeat things that have already been done. Um, however, that's not to say that those things cannot be retrialed in different light or different setting. Uh, I just think it needs to be addressed so that you know your patient's past medical history. Evaluate risk of treatment. Um, as I mentioned, I think it's very important to have an informed um, signed consent, uh, very clearly detailing out uh, risks and benefits analysis. Um, and we use a very detailed, it's actually a, it's a, almost a three page uh, pain contract in our clinic um, that's taken from a number of different um, uh, well verified uh, sources. We use uh, SAMHSA website has a um, pain management contract online. So does the ASAM, which is the Addiction Society of America online. They use a pain contract. So uh, myself and our um, key pain management provider at our clinic have kind of reviewed a number of these well validated tools to put together a comprehensive um, pain contract that works with our patients in our clinic. Um, we, and that's a good way for us to establish goals and set expectations, both as the provider, the limitations of what we can do, and then what we expect of our patients in return. Um, very basically, just uh, if nothing else, ensuring that patient comes to each visit with the prescription bottle and that we've reviewed what guidelines are for safety, um, including uh, having naloxone at home or um, the patient. 
So um, you can use, there's a lot of different pain scores out there, but one that's very simple is PEG. And you can ask someone to recall over the past week the average pain intensity. So most folks are used to the pain scale of zero being no pain, 10 being to the worst pain. That really got driven into our system when we included the terminology that is vital sign. And uh, it's not to say we cannot address pain the way we were. We just need to rethink and reframe the way we're treating pain. Um, e is the interference with enjoyment of life. So asking them, again, kind of their quality of life and their functional status, zero, zero being they have no enjoyment of life, and 10 being they're completely satisfied. Um, G stands for the interference with general activity, um, and that, that speaks to zero. Um, it's not affecting them to still drive. They're able to sleep comfortably. Um, they're able to do the activities that they enjoy, to 10 being um, uh, it, it's completely affecting everything that they're doing uh, in their life. So they had given this example, right, that uh, this person had back pain, Mrs. Healy, right, and she reported a PEG score of five, E was six, and G was five, so it totaled to 16. You just add that up, and that's a well-validated tool that you can look online. And the big thing to take home that's very difficult, but if you set up the conversation from the get-go with your patients that a 30% improvement is considered meaningful, um, if you take the time to provide education to your patients about what 30% improvement looks like, um, then that's a realistic goal for all of, for both patient and provider to be working off of as a framework. So many folks are probably very well aware of the JAMA article that came out in 2018 comparing opioids versus non-opioids for um, pain management, and there was no functional difference in functional status um, and improved pain scores in the non-opioid group. Uh, the difficulty therein lies is when we know that our patients have opioid use disorder and we don't there, therefore treat their pain adequately or understand that their perception of their pain has been altered. And that's very important uh, because oftentimes they truly are having their pain under managed and they actually are being underdosed. And there's that fine line of, of uh, safety with patients prescribing uh, if we're using opioids, but then also realizing that there's many alternatives um, and complementary uh, medicine is available and that that has been much more successful in long term, uh, in longevity for uh, patients' um, pain management. So 12 month randomized trial comparing opioids to non-opioids for moderate to severe chronic back pain as that's oftentimes one of the um, most common uh, complaints or knee, uh, hip, and that's OA for the osteoarthritis in 240 patients in the Veterans Health Administration. The average age was about 50. There were more men than women in the study and the intervention titrated opioids to 100 milli equivalents per day versus um, things that we know are over the counter like acetaminophen or non-steroidal um, um, uh, anti-inflammatory, excuse me, and then um, some TCAs or gabapentin. And then the outcome measured was the pain-related function and pain intensity. And unfortunately, right, um, we would expect there to be a difference, but there wasn't. There was no significant difference in pain-related function. Um, about 60% of patients had response in both groups. So the, the pain intensity score actually improved in the non-opioid group. And uh, I just want to state there, though, that uh, the population sampled, again, didn't have some of the representation of the DSM-5 opioid use disorder. So, again, I'm not taking opioids off the table as a conversation. I just think it has to be done safely. And I think that when we educate our patients that there are alternatives that don't have to be opioids to pain management, um, we have better success and set up um, both success for both provider and patient. So these are the different classes. I won't spend time if, if folks um, want to kind of go back and look through what all these different um, classes look like. Um, the great thing is that some patients may respond better to NSAIDs in a different class than others. So even though the patient may come in and says, I've tried the naproxone and the ibuprofen and it doesn't work for me, we can go to something else like a COX-2 inhibitor and see if that actually works for someone. Or we can, um, there's different studies coming out about um, indomethacin and catorolac being used. Um, and in, in a safe manner and um, see if actually those uh, improve pain and functional status. Just some cautions I'm going to throw out. Uh, it's well known and documented now that there's the fourfold increase in GI uh, bleed risk for NSAID use, threefold increase for um, COX-2 inhibitors, and the risk does increase with age. Uh, we also now know, right, that 
uh, proton pump inhibitors or PPIs that keep acid at bay uh, in patients with are actually at an increased risk for GI uh, complications. And you may see this week that there was the big um, study about some or release about some of the over the counter PPIs being recalled, unfortunately, due to cancer, cancer. yeah, uh, carcinogen exposure. So um, Please note to avoid in patients with um, recent cardiovascular events and avoid in patients with heart failure. So um, like any medication, it's important to get a good past medical history on your patient and make sure you have up-to-date labs and the necessary diagnostics you need to uh, be doing appropriate safe prescribing. Acetaminophen update, increase in liver enzymes. Um, often uh, need to really pay attention to this for our folks that have alcohol use disorder and looking at their labs and making sure that the LFTs are trending in the correct direction or that we're appropriately addressing. In the um, acetaminophen review in 2017, low back pain, there were 10 trials, one large placebo controlled, and there was no effect on pain or function for acetaminophen versus placebo or NSAID in, in a four week. Um, so the no study really evaluated for um, chronic or radicular pain, meaning that it's radiating to other sites. But in the BMJ review in 2015 for low back pain and osteoarthritis, um, so again, our older folks of hip and knee, uh, 13 trials for acute and uh, chronic pain. Back pain, no effect on pain or function for acetaminophen versus placebo. And then osteoarthritis, significant, but small reduction in pain score and disability noted. Uh, but again, please keep in mind to, uh, to trend those liver enzymes. So take home points, please use a stepwise safe approach. Um, and you can add or remove additional measures, right? It's not just medications. We could also recommend that patients um, go to physical therapy or go to physiatry or um, use acupuncture or massage in a safe manner um, and or use mindfulness. No single modality is going to work for everyone. It's not a one size fits all approach. Um, evidence is still mixed, as you just heard me report, um, and it's hard sometimes to measure or evaluate where we're going, but please set up an appropriate um, expectation with your patient from the get-go through education in order to tell them that, you know, we're not going to go from uh, 10 out of 10 pain to 0 out of 10 pain in a week. That's not a realistic um, measure. Long-term approach to help, and um, it's got to be the right patient, the right time, the right dose, the right route, and the right price. Don't forget that. It does as actually um, impact uh, healthcare, and if you work with the insurance company, you know all about prior authorization requirements um, for multiple of these components, and so that does need to be part of the conversation. Um, and patients may still utilize opioids, and that may be mostly appropriate for, for your patient population. Um, I not going to spend time on this. Uh, Heather already did mention the ASAM criteria, the DSM-5 criteria for opioid use disorder, and they do have um, mild, moderate, and then severe scoring. So it is kind of on a, a scale that you can track over time. And I'd like to just call your attention that there's a Center for Substance Abuse Prevention, or CSAP, <laughs> Principles of Cultural Competence, and that, um, you know, cultural competence became a real buzzword over the last few years, but please don't forget that it's so appropriate to remember to integrate in our education with our patients, um, even when we're talking about things like pain management, because pain management is so different amongst varying cultures, and we need to be very respectful and aware of that. There's a couple different um, buprenorphine algorithms that I like. This is one, although it's a little challenging to see, and I'm going to flip to uh, another one in a minute that I'm utilizing with um, the HEPA group across the state for the emergency room physicians that are becoming interested in learning about buprenorphine and getting their data waiver, which is the special requirement uh, that providers, uh, nurse practitioners, PAs, and um, uh, MDs need to prescribe buprenorphine for pain management. Um, it's not a requirement, but to treat opioid use disorder it is. So let me be very clear that if you're treating a patient just for their pain, for buprenorphine, you do not need a special certification, but oftentimes we do find that our patients do meet the clinical diagnosis and criteria for opioid use disorder, and uh, that you do need a special ex-DEA waiver number given to you by going through the data waiver training in order to prescribe buprenorphine. 
So this is one really nice, simple um, diagram, and it helps you kind of evaluate and assess whether your patient's in opioid withdrawal. So the opioid um, time frame basically is the last dose, and that's for short-acting opioids. It's about six to 12 hours. So I ask my patients to please stop use um, around you know midnight, one, two, three a.m. at the latest, and then come to the clinic very early in the morning to evaluate um, on what's called the CALS, which I'm gonna get into, which is a well-validated assessment tool to kind of track the number of uh, withdrawal symptoms that they have. And the CALS tool is used to basically help us um, get to, or recognize when the patient's at a score of an eight, showing, and you can see it here in this really nice guideline that you're gonna assess for contraindications, you're looking at their medication history, right? And you're also looking at their allergies and seeing if they're appropriate uh, by the DSM-5 criteria and what patient's telling you is their history for opioid use disorder. I'm gonna use an assessment tool called the CALS. And once they get to an eight, mild to moderate withdrawal, you can start beginning buprenorphine. And that's usually in a titrated dose. So I don't always start my patient at a four milligram dose. Sometimes I do start them at this two milligram dose. So I do recommend that buprenorphine comes in a lot of different forms. It comes in a sublingual film or it comes in a tab. If I don't have a very well-established relationship with my patient, I tend to lean towards ordering the tab so that I can cut the tab down to a two milligram dose and start them slow and go low. We know that that uh, works much better than putting somebody into a higher dose of buprenorphine and accidentally putting them into a precipitated withdrawal state. Patients will not be happy with you if you do that. They will be very angry and you will be concerned about their vitals as well. So go low and start low. I'd like to also point out that this little box I've added up here into the herring model is my own recommendations of what we do in our practice for buprenorphine clinic, and that is to talk about safety of where they're gonna store buprenorphine. It is a controlled substance. I'm using also the word buprenorphine versus Suboxone, which is the brand name, but it is interchangeable. I want to note that buprenorphine has the naloxone component, and that is the drug of uh, choice that I prescribe, not things like Subutex, which don't contain the naloxone component that do have street value um, and can be abused. Uh, driving becomes a problem. You should not be sending your patient out the door to be driving after an induction. That is not safe. So please think in advance through the first visit, through how they're going to get home, through discharge. And again, um, storage for our folks that are on the street, we talk about keeping the medication actually tucked on their person. And we ask people to come back frequently to the clinic because that's one way they can stay engaged. We can better manage their pain and assess their pain, but they can also safely store medications um, at the clinic and pick them up in doses instead of just going out the door with an entire um, you know, two week supply, for example. Um, other adjunct meds I would really recommend would be clonidine, 0.1 milligrams orally every four hours as needed. So that's for anxiety. Lopiramide for the diarrhea, ibuprofen or gabapentin, depending on what's appropriate for added pain management, because patients do experience cramping and cravings and just overall general discomfort. Here's the CALS um, sheet. Again, I'm not going to read that. Please do that on your own time, but you can see that it's very straightforward. Uh, please note, nurses are usually very comfortable with the CALS score as our um, MAs can be trained or techs in the emergency room um, or other clinical settings. You can have folks be trained on how to use this well-validated score and uh, tool, excuse me, and you can just get to a score and start uh, basically assessing the, um, uh, basically the, the where they are in their withdrawal scale. So there are some side effects of buprenorphine. So um, buprenorphine overdose and respiratory depression is very rare because it's a partial um, activation of that mu receptor as we started the presentation with. If you think about the sites on the brain kind of being like a little clinch point and the drug kind of comes and fills that hole in the brain or the receptor site, it kind of sits halfway. It's halfway in, it's halfway out, which is really great. Unlike heroin, which binds completely to that site, causing severe things like respiratory depression, buprenorphine and sits halfway in, halfway out, helping to address the pain and the cravings, but not being so far and so much that it completely locks and binds into that site, um, causing more of the severe side effects. So um, we talked earlier very briefly about intersectionality of um, some of the opioid um, prescribing practices and how um, street drugs were then really affected after people were prescribed, you know, what they what they deem legitimate pain prescriptions and then became um, 
addicted to those uh, medications. And then when they were cut off, they ended up turning to street drugs like heroin, um, you know, to kind of help fill that void and prevent them from getting ill. Um, please let me make it very clear that folks were very, very sick and they're ill and that that's a true disease that they are going out to get well and get medicated for. Um, so we need to have some empathy and some um, compassion and consideration around this. And what we unintended consequences, right, was the rise of heroin that was discussed and also the hep C. So, um, you know, if you have a really um, good opportunity, um, as we are fortunate enough to do in our clinic, we're able to uh, run a panel of labs, including rapid HIV and hep C, and then um, concurrently treat those conditions so that we're able to treat the person um, as a whole as, the, as they're being. Um, I provided some eligibility criteria for you folks around buprenorphine coverage and hep C coverage. Um, and I think that's really nice because, um, you know, we as providers are always wondering, you know, what we need to put in the documentation in order to make sure that um, everything is covered and that we're covered as well uh, for liability status. Here's some basic lab testing uh, that we recommend for um, hep C infections. So um, basically you can run a either rapid um, a, uh, hep C test and then get a blood draw for the um, RNA detection and find out whether they have the active infection, uh, the current hep C infection, and then start the continuum of linkage to care through finding out things like their viral load and their genotype and uh, getting them linked to either a specialist or someone that's comfortable in the community uh, in the primary care setting that can treat hep C. Please remember follow-up is so important for these patients. Um, you know, oftentimes our patients do need a lot of hand-holding. Our medical system is very complex and we need to remember to help our patients through the continuum of their opioid use disorder or help them follow up with their pain and then the other concurrent conditions. So I really take the opportunity and the time uh, with the patients, especially if you're thinking about the length of time it takes to do an induction. That's quite a bit of time you have with your patient to really get a full sense and scope of uh, what we can help do um, in their life to improve their quality of life and their treatment and functional status. I have provided some documentation guidelines for you folks, including some other recommendations that are evidence-based guidelines for vaccinations, TB status, um, and treatment, as well as I provided the ICD-10 codes and CPT codes for you folks. Uh, and I'll lastly leave it off at a, as a warm handoff whenever possible. We really encourage um, our community partners to help us uh, keep up with the warm handoff. That's not just the facts and call it done and dumped it off. No, that's actually taking the time to please uh, provide some basic information or send over a completed um, face sheet, HMP labs or a discharge summary. Um, and we're always happy to accept new clients. We do have this one page referral form that's found on our website, um, which is hhhrc.org. And that will be listed um, on this presentation that you're more than welcome to go to to access our services like substance use um, disorder referral form for buprenorphine management or pain management. And uh, we also have our wound care program there available if you're interested in learning more about that. And um, I'd like to then probably turn it back over to Heather here to talk more about other places that your patients can access um, treatment or other services in Hawaii. Um, I have included as well patient instructions or um, some discharge kind of summary recommendations that if you think you see a patient that is appropriate um, for buprenorphine treatment or they're interested in learning more, this is a one pager that's also available on our website that helps explain to patients how to make their first visit very successful or what an induction looks like so they can be more prepared. So there's some links and references and I'll turn it back to Heather. Thank you all so much. As you can tell, uh, we're really blessed at the Hawaii Health and Harm Reduction Center to have Dr. Wang be our medical director. Um, and as she also mentioned, we, we're blessed to have three providers that have waivers. Um, and so we really have room to support people. And I think one thing that's unique about our program is that we can help somebody who's houseless and get inducted, meaning we can actually keep them on our site and have a place for them. Um, and I don't know many other places that are actually can provide that kind of stabilization. Unfortunately, we can't do it overnight, but we can definitely do it during the day when the clinic is open and it, and it provides a way for folks that maybe didn't think they could transition to Suboxone and actually have that option. So as Dr. Wang mentioned, um, we also uh, want to spend some time talking about naloxone as well as other resources so that we can help people at risk for both opioid use disorder as well as overdose get what they need. So this slide shows you the difference between how much heroin it would take to overdose and die 
uh, compared to how much fentanyl. And then you can't really see on the current fentanyl, but there's one kernel there. And the reason I bring this up is that historically, fentanyl was really um, pervasive in Appalachia and other places on the East Coast, but only in the past couple, a year or so has Hawaii and the West Coast been seeing it. And I think that is one of the biggest concerns is as really people from other countries see the opioid use disorder happening in the United States, they saw that if they could have these much more powerful analogs like fentanyl and cart fentanyl, it's easier to smuggle into the United States. There's now, um, you know, a lot of counterfeit pills. For example, you know, Prince died um, when they did an analysis. He died of a fentanyl overdose, but the pill said oxycodone. Um, and whether he knew it was fentanyl or not, we don't know, but there's been a lot of these adulterated and synthetic drugs that are not what they say they are. And I think that we are learning a lot about how to um, prepare again as fentanyl starts to hit Hawaii. Um, I'm gonna talk a lot about naloxone. I'm gonna give you a couple of resources. I won't spend too much time on those, but wanna note this is from the CDC's uh, pain management guidelines and acknowledging um, that anybody who's on 15 morphine equivalents a day or more of um, opioid medications should also be prescribed naloxone um, uh, because of the risk of overdose. Interestingly enough, I had pneumonia um, a few months ago, and I, I won't tell who my provider is, but all I had was a cough syrup, and they offered me naloxone with my cough syrup. So I guess it's better than not at all, but it did seem a little excessive to offer me naloxone with my cough syrup, but hey, I appreciated the, the ability to talk story with the, with the nurse. Um, so our Surgeon General, um, Surgeon General Adams, um, also very much supports access to naloxone, um, as you see by the statement that came out uh, in April, that he really sees it um, in family members, um, and loved ones, as well as healthcare practitioners, and then community parts like the Hawaii Health and Harm Reduction Center and many of our other substance use and homeless service providers. So I had to throw um, a picture there of that, that's, that Surgeon General this year, actually. So he came and visited um, the Hawaii Health and Harm Reduction Center. That's my staff, Hana. And actually, as you can see there, that's Lieutenant Governor Green's head also. He was um, joining along. Um, but as uh, the Surgeon General came to our program because he actually heard about us um, and wanted to hear more about what we were doing with naloxone and said that we were best practice. So thanks for letting me. That our syringe exchange and that was at our syringe exchange van there with, with Hannah. Um, we exchange over a million syringes each, each year. So if you haven't heard about naloxone, it is a non-scheduled um, drug. Um, it has no psychoactive properties or abuse for potential. It overdoses, or it, I'm sorry, it reverses um, uh, the opioid-induced sedation and respiratory depression. It basically knocks out that opioid out of that receptor so that um, it can't get absorbed. Um, but it's also, uh, you know, in a, a, sh a short-term alleviation. It's administered either intramuscularly, intravenous, or in the nose. And the one that we use in Hawaii is intranasal. It's much easier to use. We used to use the injectable. And it lasts 30 to 90 minutes, um, but we can repeat it if the person goes back into an overdose. Just a reminder that uh, naloxone does not reverse benzodiazepines, alcohol, um, and if the person does not have opioids in their system, it will do nothing. So there's been very few um, adverse consequences in the literature, and those that are, are related to that withdrawal that Dr. Wing talked about. So somebody with severe opioid use disorder who then has naloxone, they go into such significant withdrawal that they could be very uncomfortable throwing up, um, and that is really, and even some stress on the heart, those are the only um, adverse consequences in the literature from naloxone. It's a very, very safe drug. So this is the one that we use in Hawaii. Uh, because of the opioid dollars that come to the Alcohol and Drug Abuse Division at the Department of Health, you too can get free naloxone and be trained. So anybody in the state that gets training um, from um, a certified entity can carry naloxone. Um, and again, I'll tell you how to do that. Uh, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on overdose, but really encourage you to instead to get the training. Um, I will note that in Hawaii, they looked at some of these risks for overdose. Um, and one of the ones is mixing drugs. And when they looked at the death certificates of folks that had died of opioid use disorder, I'm sorry, of opioid overdose um, in Hawaii, 43% had a benzodiazepine prescription. So especially alcohol and benzodiazepines is particularly um, at high risk. But honestly, the biggest risk for overdose is a period of sobriety or abstinence or decrease. So people use, uh, develop a tolerance they either purposely um, abstain because they're trying to um, reduce their use or they go into, you know, um, you know get, whether it's incarceration or any other kind of play. Anyway, so that when they come out and they're trying not to use, but they have that same high tolerance and that's when we see folks overdose. 
Um, so our recognition is basically that people uh, stop breathing, but they also have less oxygen that's going to their extremities. So you may see um, that blue tint of the, the fingers um, or the lips. Um, their, their breathing will be typically really slow and they may be throwing up. The way that we train folks is to give them a sternum rub. If you take your hand and press it right here, it hurts. Um, and if they don't respond, chances are they are uh, unconscious. Um, and otherwise they will say, ow, and be responsive. If they don't respond, we say call 911. Be very clear about where you are um, and as calm as possible because I'll typically keep you on the phone. Um, then we encourage people to administer naloxone. Again, it's a spray in the nose. Um, if the person is still unresponsive within two minutes, we say to repeat, because again, it may uh, be, it's a very strong opioid, for example, that may be needed. And then if the person is not breathing, we do res recommend rescue breathing until EMS arrives. Uh, we do recommend people having um, the mouth guard in order to do this, because again, we don't quite know the person's history, um, but we do recommend because the person's not breathing. And this is counter to a lot of the life-saving. They've moved away from rescue breathing and focus most on the compressions. However, with the opioid overdose, the, the breathing is actually the most important part. Um, and they actually don't recommend that you do um, chest compressions unless you don't know why, because uh, obviously it was a heart attack or something else. But that is again why we recommend calling EMS as quickly as possible is it may not be an opioid overdose, but typically if it is, they will respond literally within moments of that naloxone being administered. So finally, I want to tell you a bit about our program and how you can access our services and get trained yourself. So uh, Governor Ige signed Act 68 uh, in the summer, uh, actually three years ago. Uh, and so we've already distributed, and again, and thanks to the Department of Health, over 5,000 doses. Uh, we've trained uh, some police departments, Maui and Kauai carry um, homeless programs, looking at substance use treatment programs, even looking at the libraries, um, which on the continent have actually become a, a pretty uh, a united front um, in, both the, uh, in both the kind of war on opioid epidemics as well as the homeless crisis. We've had over 230 people that have reported uh, saving a life with our naloxone, and that's pretty incredible. Actually working with the health department to see if we can look at this statistically with also EMS calls um, and things like that to validate um, and emergency department to see if we can actually prove basically that the overdose rate went down because of these efforts. So lastly, a bit about us. Again, if you haven't heard about us, we are the joining of the Life Foundation, the largest and oldest HIV program in the islands actually in the Pacific, and the Chow Project, a statewide street-based and syringe exchange program. And we merged last year, and our new mission statement is to reduce harm, promote health, create wellness, and fight stigma in Hawaii and the Pacific. We, uh, as you can tell by our name, we really embrace the tenets of harm reduction. Um, and so both literally and figuratively, we support people where they are. We have about half our services are on the street. Though, of course, we try to build relationships to help them come into the clinic where they can get more comprehensive care. Uh, we try to have very low threshold and low barrier. It takes very little um, documentation to access our services. Uh, we try to really meet people, not just where they are um, on the streets, but also with their behavior change. If they're not ready to make these changes, we'll work with them with whatever goals they want to set. Um, and we really believe in having uh, folks that have had lived experience as part of the solution. About half of the staff at our agency are either in recovery, um, uh, struggling with mental health, or have been in the criminal justice system, or formerly homeless. So our services, we have a bunch of street-based services, as you heard about. Uh, Dr. Wang is in Chinatown, uh, both Tuesday and Friday mornings. So one thing is um, we often do get referrals of like, hey, look for this person down in Aala Park <laughs> or down at Fort Street Mall. And she tries, don't you, Dr. Wing, to try to find uh, those folks. So the, uh, on the street is the big thing is wound care, but also some testing, linkage to services, some homeless outreach as well. Um, and then uh, more and more our mental health services with Courtney is coming to the streets. And then as Christina mentioned, we really believe and not just referrals, but as much as possible warm handoffs. So on our website, you will see referral forms to refer people for wound care, uh, for buprenorphine, and also for our, um, our HIV program. Um, and any of our warm handoffs, what that means is that we have funding and support that oftentimes we can provide some transportation, where especially if the person's living with HIV, we can 
send an outreach worker or a navigator to the hospital to meet with them, to go with them to, you know, even draw their blood at their house. Like we can really wrap around that person. Um, and then sometimes we can, you can just send them to our clinic. But if you want to know more, go to our website and we're trying to really um, encourage folks to get to know that so that we can do a warm handoffs when possible, because we find that our participants and patients thrive. And just a little bit about our clinic hours. We are open Monday through Friday, um, though again, uh, Dr. Wang's on the streets Tuesday and Friday mornings. But probably best is our, our Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then Tuesday and Friday afternoons. So our, here's our website, um, again, hawaiiopioid.org. We have two websites that give you access to naloxone, um, and then several of the guidelines you talked about from ASAM, you can get the ASAM website. And I think we have a couple of minutes left for questions. So thank you very much, everybody. We really appreciate your commitment and hope that you will join us in the Hawaii Opioid Initiative. Um, if you're in a clinic and want to do more with buprenorphine, we have an active uh, hui of folks with the emergency department um, that we meet about once a month. So there's lots of ways to get connected with any of the issues that we've talked about today. Okay, so we have a few questions in the Q&A box. Uh, one was, what are the concerns regarding opioid use amongst the elderly in Hawaii? Sure. Um, so as I mentioned, the data um, does indicate that at least our opioid overdose deaths um, are in older folks. So the couple of things that we know about um, is that if somebody is on um, pain medication, we really want to help um, help them track the use of that. So those pill boxes that had the AM, PM kind of thing, where somebody loads that medical management or med management, basically where somebody, a family member um, or a medical provider does that ahead of time. Um, so the one Kapuna I know that overdosed that did not have that. So it was relying upon her memory to go back into the prescription bottle. Um, and I don't know about you guys, I'm not a reliable historian, <laughs> let alone, um, you know, so folks that may be older in life and not remember when they took it. So that's that's one really concrete. We see a lot of vascular dementia in the community, and it's, it's one of our biggest areas yeah. of unmet need and the aging population of our community. So when we don't have good med management or help to our Kapuna that are out there with a lot of memory impairment, we, unfortunately, we do see a lot of elderly that are houseless. Uh, it gets to be a real struggle when they come out of the emergency room, for example, with a pill bottle full of Percocets, and they take the whole thing at once as, and then mix it with other medications that they may be on, that they might have been on for, for many, many years. It gets to be very serious. Yeah. So I think that is, um, that's the biggest, that's the biggest piece. And then the other one is not as uh, relevant to them, but it goes back to that um, disposal. So we definitely have data in Hawaii that some people acts get into these by going into their other people's med medical su medicine supply. Let's just be honest. Um, and so being able to uh, properly dispose of medications when you're done with them um, is really important so that people can't get, get into them. Um, especially when I don't know about you, but when my dad when my dad passed away, we cleaned it up, and I he had every medication since like the 1960s in his, <laughs> in his medicine cabinet. And I don't think he's never knew when you were going to need it. Yeah, you just never know, even though they're expired. So those are a few of the things I'm aware of, um, and we're wanting to work more with caregivers, um, the care homes. Um, as well. And then if you talk about our young people, we're trying to work with, um, you know, coaches and because we definitely see people with injuries be yeah. here. So again, it's really looking at anybody who might kind of interface. This is a very different than when we're talking about methamphetamine, for example, not that there's not a medicinal purpose for that. Like, you know, when you're talking about something like Adderall, but it's very different. Yeah. Okay. What is the difference between methadone versus buprenorphine as far as treatment goes? Do you have data on how long patients are on medication treatment program? Yes, I do. And um, there's a lot of differences between methadone and buprenorphine. And if you're really interested, please do go peruse the ASAM website. They make it very clear with the literature of what's out there. Um, just of note, patients that are on methadone cannot consistently and concurrently start buprenorphine. Uh, they don't work in conjunction. It would be very dangerous. Methadone remains, it has a very long half-life. Um, and it remains actually for people who have been on methadone for years in their bone. And it takes time to leach out of their system uh, in order to do a safe conversion. So that's one piece. The second piece is um, most recent literature has been showing that buprenorphine has been more effective at treating opioid use disorder. And it does, uh, literature shows us that about uh, patients who remain on buprenorphine for about five years have the longest success with maintaining their sobriety. That's not to say, again, that's a one-time, you know, one-fits-all model, uh, but that is kind of what the longitudinal studies are showing us. And there are different forms of buprenorphine becoming available. As I mentioned, there's a sublingual will film, there's tablets, and now there's an, a, a long-acting um, implant 
event. Um, and that is a training that we will be uh, hosting actually on September 28th, although we are full at this time, I'm sorry, for providers to learn how to input an implant in the arm, very similar to some of the long acting contraceptive methods that are available. And um, that's been very successful for patients who have found that buprenorphine is very successful in terms of treating both their pain and their opioid use disorder who are very um, stabilized on that medication so that they don't have to take medications every day. So I'd really encourage folks to please go and read the ASAM guidelines. They've also done an excellent job um, surmising the differences and similarities between methadone and buprenorphine. Uh, just to note again, buprenorphine is that partial um, mechanism, so uh, it's not quite as sedating as methadone, and I think that our patients really enjoy that because they're actually able to really um, have a much more enriched quality of life than when they go and dose every day at a methadone clinic and oftentimes are very, very sleepy and can't do um, much uh, functional status after they go and receive their daily methadone. Yeah. But one other difference I would just note is how do you acquire it? Yes. Um, there's only two uh, methadone providers in the entire state of Hawaii. Again, kind of like uh, Dr. Wang was talking about, you can do methadone for pain, but if you're doing methadone for opioid use disorder, we have CHAMP Clinic on uh, Maui and Oahu, and we have Ku Aloha Ola Mau uh, and Hilo in here, and that's it. So people who want methadone have to go every day there until they qualify for a take-home dose, um, which depending on the site could take longer. Uh, and for example, if you're in Kona, you'd have to, for our, our neighbor island friends, you know you have to drive all the way to Hilo every day to get dosed. Whereas Suboxone, um, at least in our clinic, we give you some to take home. And we monitor probably more closely than many do. We do. Because <laughs> many people get their first month, right? Or, or yeah, many, a couple weeks couple at a time. A couple weeks at a time and then transition over to a month. You know, oftentimes we start people on a, on a once a one week regimen just so we can bring them back and just get a lot of continuity of care and comfort with our patients, particularly folks that we haven't maybe worked with uh, over a number of times so we can really get established and really make sure that we're meeting their best needs and where they're at and then also ensuring the safety um, because uh, we one thing we really haven't spent a lot of time today on is the benzo addiction in our community and um, that's so that's a whole nother issue uh, that people have been inappropriately pres prescribed benzodiazepines for a very long time and people actually do become um, that is its own disorder yeah. and uh, in conjunction with other pain meds that also becomes very dangerous so we just are carefully helping to monitor our folks to help with best prescribing practices. Um, we have another question. Admiral Greyer, I'm, I'm probably said the name wrong, um, said our OD rates from March 2018 through February 2019 for psychostimulants was 80% this morning. Would you folks agree that that would be the highest it's been? Uh, so again, this overdose for, so one thing, you're right. So now that we have been able to address, I think, the opioid overdose, we are seeing, the last data I saw, saw huge increases in our stimulant overdoses. Mm -hmm. And I think we're learning a lot more about that because I think there's also a difference between acute overdose, right, Dr. Wang, and a chronic long-term heart, can, heart, the kind of heart issues that come with stimulant use. what people yeah. unfortunately term meth heart or, um, you know, things that are related to um, heart failure, related to poly um, substance use, because oftentimes it is kind of a mixture. Uh, unfortunately, we do see a huge methamphetamine uh, you know, use here in the state, and it's um, very trialing and, and uh, troubling that we don't have some available medications like we do for alcohol use disorder and opioid use disorder. Um, but one thing I will say is there's new trials coming out on the use of Adderall as treatment, and that is currently off-label, not FDA, so I'm not um, making any statement around that. I'm just <laughs> encouraging you, if you're interested, to please go look up those clinical trials that are now starting um, for Adderall replacement for methamphetamine use disorder, and then also um, being involved in unity enough to help educate your patients to be aware that uh, a lot of times the street drugs they're receiving are not clean cut. They're mixed with other things like fentanyl and other uh, drugs that we know um, require much lower dosage but have very serious consequences and more rapid overdose. Uh, and I think that's what we're seeing. You know, you'll hear um, slang on the streets like white china um, and uh, other drugs that come up like uh, from Mexico, black tar, um, heroin that are mixed with other uh, substances. And that's where people really get into trouble and don't expect uh, to have those types of drugs mixed in with what they're already used to. And just to kind of note on that, we do do fentanyl test strips with our um, population, the Department of Health bought them mm -hmm. for us. And we have had people who have notified us that their methamphetamine has tested positive for fentanyl. Um, and so, you know, on the continent, it's become so pervasive, it's entering and adulterating almost every drug. And we haven't seen that as much here, but it is starting to happen. And um, so there's that concern too. But I think that the comment from the participant is right on, and we need to learn a lot more about, um, about that. Yeah, like. and to really figure out what can we do to address this. 
Someone had asked what services are available for outer, uh, on outer islands. That's a great question. Um, there actually is a growing uh, Suboxone um, and buprenorphine. I should say buprenorphine. So I know at least on uh, so on Hawaii Island on the east side there is a pool Loha Olamau. They do both uh, buprenorphine and methadone. On the west side, I know the West uh, West Hawaii Community Health Center. I think had the first uh, community health center to have um, uh, medications for opioid use disorder, and so they have a pretty thriving program. Um, I know on Maui, um, Alama Ike Ola, I just heard is starting their um, medications for opioid use disorder um, program, which is exciting. And there's a CHAMP clinic on Maui as well as a handful of Suboxone providers. Um, oh, poor Kauai. I'm sorry, you guys. It's, well, probably you're always struggling, but there's no methadone provider there. There are a handful of Suboxone providers um, on Kauai. And right. part of this process that uh, Dr. Wang and I are helping look at are what what uh, provider do want to partner with their local emergency departments? Because according to our data, we, and that's actually how Dr. Wing and I first started doing this work many years ago, is we found that our folks were going to the emergency department four to five times the national average. They were going for two reasons, wounds um, and detox or opioid use disorder. And then we found that people go, and then they start to get sick because of withdrawal symptoms and they aren't treated, then they leave against medical advice and then come back to the hospital. So anyway, doing inductions of Suboxone within the hospital setting makes so much sense on a lot of levels. We just need providers to help catch them on the outside with that warm handoff and the continuity. 17 new emergency room physicians across yeah, the Yeah, so we just had really yeah, big props to the um, Hawaii chapter of the um, the uh, emergency room, what's the exact? ASAP. ASAP, the Academy of the emergency room physicians because they just um, supported the training of 17 new emergency room doctors and buprenorphine in the waiver training. And that was including neighbor island folks. And yes. Then, um, uh, also just to note that um, the Hawaii Health and Harm Reduction Center's um, former branch, right, CHAL, as you may know us, has their SEP program across neighbor islands. So if you are looking for um, access to safe the yeah, right, or any or of those others, yes. So, so on our website, we have um, somebody in Hilo, somebody in Kona, someone on Kauai, and someone on Maui. So yeah. And then if you just um, go to the, if you just uh, Google Suboxone providers, the maker of Suboxone has a list of everybody who's gone through the waiver on their website. So that also has every Suboxone provider. They may be full because unfortunately, they're, and, 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 the, and the, you know, the government's wisdom, they put a cap on how many patients, especially in the first year, uh, people can take. So um, just be aware of some of those other regulatory guidelines. Yeah. And then um, on the um, um, website, the the one I showed the other day, I'm trying to think. Uh, it also tells you where all the CHAMP clinic locations, or oh, okay. where all the methadone clinic locations yeah. are. Yeah. Are there concerns or data amongst use among, uh, among pregnant women? Is this a population that Hawaii is seeing as opioid users? I'll start and I'll turn it over to you. So, um, yeah, so we, uh, as many people may know, at least on Oahu, um, we actually have some data because we have the PATH clinic, the Perinatal Addiction Treatment and Health Clinic, that is a collaboration between Salvation Army Family Treatment Services and Waikiki Health. Um, and just up till just recently, it was um, staffed by Dr. Trisha Wright of the school of, the, of JAPSM and was actually a nationwide, if not an international expert, um, as an OBGYN and as a data waiver um, and addiction specialist. So we um, and so she actually specialized in working with pregnant women, um, and that was really her. Area. My, my limited understanding, um, and I'd like to turn to Dr. Wang for more, is that we see a, lo a lot of concerns with the method with women, pregnant women on methadone, on the impact with the baby. So, I'll turn, uh, but I do know that we have that clinic is a specialty, and I know that they help um, other uh, folks on the other islands get expertise because they're the only truly addiction, um, parent, you know, work for women without a pregnant and, and, and young children. So maybe if Heather will know. I'm not sure who's going to be replacing the three our right? lovely Trisha Wright, <laughs> yeah. who is just phenomenal, who also did a lot of the trainings for the national guidelines for ASAM for buprenorphine. And there is um, a way to safely prescribe buprenorphine for pregnant um, individuals. Um, however, I will be really clear, we're not managing that in our clinic here at um, H3RC. We do turn that over to um, OBGYNs that do have um, really more of the expertise uh, and the specialty uh, to care for our folks that are pregnant um, and then meeting buprenorphine because it, while it is a safe uh, medication for pregnancy, uh, there's different regulations around when you can start the medication and stop medications in preparation for delivery. So it's a little more complicated and unfortunately we do see now uh, the rise of um, hep c in our pregnant women um, and having to co-manage uh, hep c in, in the pregnant population has been really challenging so um, that's really all i really really want to comfortably say okay. on it but uh, just know that uh, buprenorphine is available for for folks that are currently pregnant
is the recommended medications for opioids lifelong medications or just for a period of time? Yeah, that's a good question. Again, I, I don't think uh, there's an answer that fits everybody's uh, current situation, but uh, data showing us for, for buprenorphine that about five years of consistent regular use um, has helped maintain people's sobriety around the 80-90%. I will note a lot of those longitudinal studies were done actually with uh, nurses who um, were um, actually had their license suspended for their opioid use disorder and they were so you know encouraged because they wanted to go back to get their license and be reinstated in practice um, to really treat their uh, um, their opioid use disorder and so uh, there are other groups actually even locally uh, that you can if you yourself are struggling um, with opioid use disorder that you can reach out to um, or for alcohol use disorder that include judges and people that have a license that have been suspended and they need to work towards getting their license reinstated. So some of those um, studies have really focused their efforts around that population to really track them over a period of time. And that five-year mark seems to really make a difference for folks on maintaining their sobriety and improving their quality of life. Um, someone had asked, if a patient has a dual diagnosis of a mental health disease and a heroin use disorder, what is a common mental health um, disease? Is it usually depression, schizophrenia, anxiety? Mm. That's a tough question. There, um, we deal a lot with folks that are um, dual, what they call dual diagnosed, meaning they do have underlying mental health issues, and then they may be self-medicating um, through different uh, street drugs or prescription drugs, uh, pain medications, and uh, it can be very challenging and does require the right um, psychiatrist or psychiatric nurse practitioner um, or um, other our psychology folks to help us tease out what current, what really is current um, substance use and what is. Um, kind of or more organic uh, in nature. And um, I don't necessarily think there's a direct correlation between just equally saying it's always schizophrenia, it's always depression. That's not true. It's a, it's a very mixed bag. And we, um, what we do know, though, is our folks that particularly are houseless under, are undergoing enormous stress and PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And that leads to um, a wide array of different um, substance use and uh, different um, you know, behaviors that uh, kind of come out of that um, really very traumatic experience. Um, and unfortunately, most of our females that we engage with have been raped. Um, and so there is a large range of services that we really need to be able to offer to our folks that, that touch on both the mental health issue and on the um, addiction medicine piece. Um, really need to treat both concurrently to have effective treatment plan. I'll share a little bit about our um our data, so we do run the statewide syringe exchange, which we just hit our 30th anniversary, because um, Hawaii was the first state to have it. And we do annual evaluations of a representative sample. Um, according to that data, 85% of our syringe exchange participants have been diagnosed uh, with a mental health disorder, and it was anxiety and depression were the highest. Um, but again, I, you know, I think that I think that Dr. Wang speaks very well because especially when you look at we also add the ACEs, the adverse childhood experiences, those 10 questions, um, and probably not surprising, we had an average of like 7.1 among our syringe exchange participants, so very high levels of trauma, um, so that self-medication piece is very, is very important. And I, and I think a lot of folks get misdiagnosed with schizophrenia when truly it's more uh, schizoaffective disorder. Mm -hmm. And somebody had asked, uh, again, if you could just reiterate, where can people get naloxone for their using family and friends? Sure. So uh, right now, you can uh, get it from our agency free. Um, and we have two ways to do that. You can, uh, our, our website is hhhrc.org, and you can find out there an email or call us. You can come into our office and do it one-on-one. -on -one. We also do free trainings for agencies, or we have one coming up at, at our own agency in about a week or two that anybody can come to. And again, you can find out about that on our website. So if you're part of an agency, and we go to neighbor islands as well. In fact, uh, Leilani's on Maui, training uh, Maui folks around the lock zone today. Right, yep, so yeah, so feel free to call us at 521-2437, uh, check out our website, and again, you can do it individually or come to a training, or we can coordinate a training for you. All of that is free, thanks to the, to the Department of Health. Again, you're also welcome to go to your pharmacy now, um, but there may be a copay yeah. there. Okay, thank you everybody, we really appreciate it. All right, hi everyone, this is Steph. Um, I just wanna say thank you again to Heather and Dr. Christina Wang for um, being our presenters today. I wanna to thank all the participants for joining us on the webinar. Um, I will be sending out a link with the evaluation um, 
this afternoon. And if you don't receive that, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, as a reminder, our next webinar will be on Friday, October 11th, and the topic is Advanced Care Planning to Improve Patient Care. Um, there will be a link to register for this webinar in the evaluation email. So again, thank you so much and hope to see you next month. Bye.